I've said it before and I'll say it again, it's a good time to be into television. Not only has network TV continued to improve year after year since The Sopranos and X-Files set the standard, even if it did sort of peak with Psych, but Netflix continues to roll out these glorious, binge-friendly, serialized movies, basically. Everyone's got a favorite or two. Orange is the New Black, House of Cards, Marco Polo, Narcos. It's staggering, honestly, how many great shows they've managed to crank out. One recent show in particular really managed to grab me, and no, it's not Voltron, although that was a good watch too. Stranger Things is a brilliant and beautiful throwback to classic 80s filmmaking and horror writing. It's been described as Stephen King shot through the lens of Steven Spielberg, and that description is apt. In tone, style, and content, it feels very much like a mashup of The Goonies and The Mist. The plot concerns a young boy named Will who goes missing in the small town of Hawkins, Indiana. As the grown-ups band together to find him, his friends launch their own investigation, and in the process discover that there's something much stranger going on than a simple disappearance. You've seen many parts of this story before, but it's been a long time since they've been executed so well. Stranger Things is a potently nostalgic show that revels in 80s culture and kitsch. Music, fashion, books, games, and of course movies. It harkens back to a time before the internet, in the dawn of the 24-hour news cycle, when kids were still free and eager to run around playing outside, and when young geeks would come together in dingy basements for elaborate role-playing campaigns. It was also a time when PG-13 really meant something, where a kid could go to a movie with that label and expect to hear a few swears, maybe see a girl in her underwear, and get their own pants scared off them by genuinely frightening monster effects and a generous, but not gratuitous, helping of blood and gore. Compare the modern standard bearer for PG-13 horror, Krampus, to the likes of Monster Squad, Big Trouble in Little China, Poltergeist, Ghostbusters, and Gremlins, and you'll see what I mean. Stranger Things brings that tone and level of challenging subject matter back, albeit for a TV-14 audience, and I'm glad that I can still have that kind of experience somewhere, even if it's not in a theater. And Stranger Things provides quite a lot more of that experience than you get from most movies, considering that it clocks in at a healthy eight hours long. Instead of just focusing on the kids and their mysterious new psychic friend Eleven, it's able to take time to explore the lives of the town's adults as well. We learn a lot about Police Chief Hopper and how he's struggled with losing a child of his own, something that makes finding Will a lot more personal for him. We see in detail how Will's disappearance has affected his mom and brother. We get plenty of time to watch as our protagonist, Mike's older sister, gets caught up in the romantic tribulations and drama and poolside monster attacks that are oh so typical of high school. Characters who would just be background elements in something like The Goonies are fleshed out and given depth. The show manages to make you feel for pretty much everyone with a speaking role, and it's all conveyed through an impressive authentic style of filmmaking. Show creators Matt and Ross Duffer used high-end Red Dragon cameras to film the show in high definition, but they passed footage through a color filter very reminiscent of the Kodak film stock used in the 80s, along with film grains scanned directly from that same stock. The resulting picture feels like something straight out of that era, but with a level of fidelity that you can only get from modern digital equipment. The Duffer brothers aren't afraid to use modern technology and sensibilities where it can enhance their production. They also understand understand that sometimes you need to go a little more retro than the actual retro film you're emulating in order to fully capture the feel of that era. Where most films of the time would utilize a John Williams score, or a two-bit knockoff of a John Williams score, Stranger Things makes heavy use of ambient synth music, the same sort of tracks used for indie horror darling It Follows. Even though this kind of music was born in the 80s, filmmakers didn't really use it at all back then. I mean, of course they didn't. They were aiming to create something timeless and chose music to suit that, whereas Stranger Things aims to place its audience in a very specific place and time. The slow, heady electronic score is perfect for that. It's also incredibly well suited to the slow, tense horror that, when juxtaposed with the idyllic nostalgia of the setting, makes the show so powerful. You may have seen these story beats before, heck, you'll probably be able to predict most of what's coming from the premise, but when they hit, that doesn't really matter because they hit with precision and stunning honesty. The writing in this show is great. 
Every character, even the supporting cast, has depth to them, and every aspect of the production works to enhance that depth. There are many clever, meaningful shots and cuts, of course, and the score works with every scene, but even the costume and set design is meticulously detailed in support of the script. You can tell that Mike's mom is a control freak, for example, from her eerily perfect clothing and hair. Yet that's not all she is. She cares deeply for her kids, but she doesn't know how to connect with them. She sees that her controlling nature is pushing them away, but she can't help herself. She's bad at noticing big problems right under her nose, but she obsesses over small, obvious ones that don't matter. I can tell you all of that about her, yet she only gets a few minutes of screen time in the entire show. And that's true of pretty much any side character I could point to, from the pencil pusher who manages the evil government research lab, to the idiots who bully Mike and his friends. These characters draw heavily on archetypes, of course, and I worry that many viewers might dismiss the show on the grounds that it's cliché, without considering how it executes on the tropes that it makes use of. As much as we want originality from our media, there's very little inherent value in a cool new concept for a character or story beat. It's how stories explore and explain these ideas that really matters. Who a character is isn't nearly as interesting as why they are that way. Coming up with a new idea makes it easier to find new ground to cover, of course, but when used right, a cliché lets us understand a character more quickly with very little additional information. For example, we only need to meet the bully's overbearing rich mother once to fully grasp what made him into such an entitled little asshole. And that level of understanding, in turn, makes what could be unrealistic story beats, such as the bully chasing Mike and his friends around the woods with a knife, into something more believable. And that, I think, is what really distinguishes Stranger Things from being basic nostalgia fodder. Yes, the show revels in 80s media. References to The Thing, E.T., Jaws, and Star Wars abound, right down to the scenes and shots that were lifted straight from those wholesale. But those references are justified in a story with a high degree of verisimilitude. The Duffer brothers have an interesting story to tell that just happens to be, in part, about what it was like to be a kid in that era, and part of being a kid in any time period is contextualizing your experiences through the media that you absorb. This is demonstrated clearly in a moment where the kids break down the concept of parallel worlds using a D&D &D map and miniatures. And because we've got this perspective built into the story, all of the references feel very earned and, to borrow a film music term, diegetic. That is, they emerge from a place within the narrative rather than being layered on top of it. And this is a quality that has set the good throwbacks apart from the bad for a very long time now. Much of the early work of the film Brats, which Stranger Things as itself emulating was originally intended to be a revival of things that they remembered from their childhoods. For instance, Star Wars and Indiana Jones draw heavily from the adventure serials of the 30s and 40s that Spielberg and Lucas grew up on, and there are plenty of subtle and overt references to those and other films built into them, but none of that feels incongruous or gets in the way because the movies have their own stories to tell. Compare that to something like Uncharted, which has no story to tell and exists entirely to pretend it's Indiana Jones, or Super 8, where film and film references basically are the story. Actually, you could draw a lot of comparisons between Super 8 and Strange Things. Kids in a small town embarking on a secretive adventure involving some sort of creature that the US government wants to keep secret, side plots about the parents and cops investigating the mystery separately. But the other big difference is that Stranger Things actually has time to flesh out its extraneous story bits. In case you couldn't tell, I really really enjoyed this show. It brings back a style of filmmaking that's been missing for a long time now, while still managing to be, very distinctly, its own thing. That said, it's not perfect, but my one big gripe is sort of the only possible spoiler for the show, so if you don't want to hear that, click the annotation on screen or the timecode in the description to skip it. The spoiler starts now! The biggest flaw in this creature feature, by a wide margin, is the creature itself. The unnamed extra-dimensional monstrosity that takes Will from his home just isn't all that scary. It is impressive, especially given that it was brought to life mainly through puppeteering and animatronics, but the design doesn't feel all that special. The creature's look was inspired by classic horror artists, particularly the work of H.R. Geiger, Clive Barker, Guillermo del Toro, and Silent Hill's Masahiro Ito, but the final product is more derivative than it ought to be. 
The creature looks more like a generic mook from Silent Hill Downpour than it does a credible final boss from one of the Japanese games. It's this fleshy humanoid with a head that blossoms out into a mouthful of teeth, which is interesting, but not all that rewarding after a good five episodes of build-up to its reveal. Like many movie monsters, it ends up being a lot scarier before you see it than after. With that said, and with the exception of a few spotty CGI sequences, they really do sell its presence in the world. A lot of that comes down to the skill of the actors. Whether or not you believe the monster is really there in any given scene, you can tell that they do. The performances in Stranger Things are strong more or less across the board. The acting isn't exactly naturalistic, the government bad men are a bit hammy in their villainy, but it is believable and well suited to the tone of the story. The child actors especially impressed me with their range and ability to immerse themselves in the world of the show. These are young post-millennials, but never once did I question that they live in a time without smartphones, where home video games are a rarity and the internet doesn't exist at all. The existence of shows like this makes it all the more baffling that so few Hollywood films can seem to find a convincing child star to save their lives. Stranger Things excels in pretty much every area you could hope for from a production like this. It sells its setting better than most feature films these days, yet despite and in some cases because it's so caught up in references and minutia, it manages to tell a strong human story. And if you're still on the fence about whether or not you ought to watch it, you totally should, like right now. It's been quite some time since I've seen anything on the big or small screen that hit these notes anywhere near this hard, and I'm giving it a gold medal rating. If you want to watch a few shorter things before you start watching that, though, you should check out a few of the other videos on my channel, like my commentary on the similarly time-locked anime thriller Erased, or my review of Gravity Falls, which isn't much shorter at 40 minutes long, but still counts, damn it! And if you enjoyed this video and you want to catch everything I make from here on out, subscribe to Mother's Basement and be sure to turn on notifications by clicking the little gear symbol next to the subscribe button to guarantee that YouTube will tell you about everything I'm making. Also, you can follow me on Twitter at G0FFTHU for up-to-the-minute updates on everything I'm doing and complaints about how much it sucks to be sick, which would have preemptively explained how weird my voice sounds in this video. Thank you for watching, and thank you especially if you're one of the incredibly generous people who supports me on Patreon. It's thanks to you that I'm able to keep doing what I do and make extra videos like this one, which was put together by an editor who you guys paid for. On top of that, thank you for your patience with me taking chances on projects like this, covering things that are outside my typical wheelhouse like TV shows. If you enjoyed this review, be sure to let me know and I'll do more things like it in the future. For now though, this is Jeff Thu, professional shitbag, signing out from my dingy D&D playin' mother's basement. Don't be a pussy! Fireball hit!